shall we ask that our Heavenly Father guide us in our study? Begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this Sabbath, we thank you for this new opportunity we have to open your word. We thank you, Father, for your blessings through this week that has ended. We ask, Father, for your guidance now. Help us, direct us, and guide us so that in all things we may do that which you would have us to do. We need to learn, Father. We need to be prepared for that which is soon to come. Cleanse us. Help us so that we may become the people that you would want us to be to give this message to this final world. Help us direct us in this path, guide us as you would have us to walk. For this we thank you and this we praise you now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, I have several documents that, that we're going to be going over as we have been going through this study in the book of Malachi. We have multiple things that I think that we have been looking to learn over the last several weeks. Now we are in the fourth chapter of Malachi. Last week we got into the first two verses of Malachi 4. We're going to hopefully get a couple more verses into this today, but we're going also going to touch on many things that Mrs. White has provided. Now, as I was preparing for this, there was items from what she has written that I have found very interesting and very direct about the time in which we live. I'm going to read to you from Review and Herald, 12th of June, 1900. I will be adding this to, to my notes later. I'm going to ask you the question, does this sound like something that we are seeing today? When Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest, with Caiaphas, the Jewish high priesthood ended, the service had become base and corrupt. It had no longer any connection with God. Truth and righteousness were hateful in the eyes of the priests. They were tyrannical and deceptive, full of selfish, ambitious schemes. Such ministration could make nothing perfect, for it was itself utterly corrupt. The grace of God had not to do with it. Virtually, Caiaphas was no high priest. He wore the priestly robes, but he had no vital connection with God. He was uncircumcised in heart. Proud and overbearing, he proved his unworthiness ever to have worn the garments of the high priest. He had no authority from heaven for occupying the position. He had not one ray of light from God to show him what the work of the high priest was or for what the office was instituted. So perverted had the priesthood become that when Christ declared himself the son of God, Caiaphas in pretended horror rent his robes and accused the Holy One of Israel of blasphemy. How many times today do we observe the charts that were ordained by God to be set aside by those that are in authority within the church. How many times is the covenant of God that he has offered with his people being set aside? What are we to do here? How are we to approach this? Now, 
Here again, I have a, a document that we will be using in the notes, but I'm going to read you some, some items with another question. But there's a very pointed comment that Mrs. White makes. Now, as we, as we have stated, we're studying the book of Malachi. Malachi 4 is quite direct. And we're studying Malachi as, as symbolic. Yes, we are studying Malachi as symbolic. That is correct. Is there a question as to why we are studying it symbolically? Well, the, the idea that we have here is that it's applying to us now and that we right. need to understand it as symbols. And it has to do also with what Ellen White has said. Uh, right. I can't remember specifically what the statement was. Well, we're gonna, I'm going to give this to you. Now, Southern Watchmen, over the study of this book, I have commended to you that this entire series from Southern Watchmen in 1905 should be studied and should be taken for our time and for our admonition. Behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked, and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Do we not find this in the first part of Malachi 4? Is this admonition not given to us by the prophet Malachi? Uh -huh. As the children of Israel, God's favored people persisted in rebellion, notwithstanding the warnings and reproofs he had sent them, they were challenged to prepare to meet their God. By his appointed agents, the Lord sent them message after message, which they only despised and rejected. And now they must prepare to meet his retributive judgments. They would not prevail against him. For lo, he that formeth the mountains and createth the wind and declareth unto man what is his thought, that maketh the morning darkness and that treadeth down the high places of the earth. The God of hosts is his name. As an offended judge, the Lord would execute his judgments upon his impenitent people. If they would escape his vengeance, they must humble their hearts and confess their sins. Do you have any, anything to say about what Mrs. White just wrote here? Well, we're in the same place as ancient Israel just before or during the time of Christ, I guess. Now, what Mrs. White writes next, Southern Watchmen, March 14th, 1905, paragraph number four. Malachi was inspired to give this prophecy not only for the instruction of Israel, but for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world has come. Okay, that was which, which issue of the Southern Watchmen? Uh, Southern Watchmen, 14th yeah. of March, yeah. 1905. <clears throat> okay. Now, what I find very interesting is that this portion of Southern Watchmen was being written at about the same time as Mrs. White provides the admonition about the destruction that is about to come upon Nashville. Exactly. 
if we have any question about what Mrs. White is doing here, all we have to do is go back to exactly what she's written. You know, what's the, what's the date of her vision again? The, the first vision she has of Nashville. It's either 1905 or 1906. I know it's 1905. I just can't remember the date um, when it is. I don't have that up in front of me right now. <laughs> okay. Now, now it's interesting too, with the Southern watchman, um, because Ellen White writes, well, messages that are, are a lot more pointed than some that were seen in the review at that time. Very much. Yeah. Which, which I'm not sure why that is. But she has these message, a message to ministers, a message to the church, a message of judgment. Um, there's all these things that she's saying here that are very, very, very pointed messages. Uh, but at that time in 1905, you don't see that in the review. A lot of the pointed messages. Well, then let's let's go to a different uh, a, a different document that I have right now. Yeah. What is before you is Review and Herald, November eighth, nineteen oh six, and the title thereof is what? A solemn message to the church. Okay. We are rapidly nearing the close of this earth's history. The end is very near, much nearer than many suppose. And I feel burdened to urge upon our people the necessity of seeking the Lord earnestly. Many are asleep. And what can be said to arouse them from their carnal slumber? The Lord would have his church purified before his judgment shall fall more signally upon the world. So what is the Lord looking to do here? Wake people. Looking, exactly. But he's also looking to purify his church. Now, now it's interesting, too. Um, the book's book, Prophets and Kings. Yes. Um, when you go through that, the time that that's written is in each time that you have this apostasy going on in the church. And you can almost read into it the way that she's writing about the history of uh, the kings and the prophets that in the back of her mind, she has contemporary events. Correct. Yeah. So that she's, she's addressing sometimes these things slightly obliquely rather than directly for people to, uh, to hear because there is this sort of pressure against spirit of prophecy at that time. Is that any different from what we're seeing today? No. I mean, I've, 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 used, I've used this example several times. I know very well of a church, an Adventist church, an Adventist church approved by the conference where I live where the pastor was offered a series of Ellen White books for the church library. Oh. And he declined those books because, quote, we don't use her writings here. Yeah. Shocking. I heard that. No, not really. I've heard that in a church that I was in in California. I found a, a, a stash of them, and the new pastor basically threw them out. It's amazing, isn't it? Not really. Not anymore. Well, isn't it? it to me, it's, it, it's kind of amazing because this is a, a wonderful example of a carnal slumber. Christ will remove every pretentious cloak. No mingling of the true with the spurious can deceive him. He is like a refiner's fire separating the precious from the vile and the dross from the gold. Here again, Malachi. 
like the Levites, God's chosen people are set apart by him for his special work. So if Malachi is writing more for our time, does this not also show us that the Levites, that God's chosen people, those who would be priests and those who would be Levites, are to be set aside? that they are to be prepared for the work that is to be before them. Mm -hmm. Every true Christian bears priestly credentials. He is honored with the sacred responsibility of representing to the world the character of his heavenly father. He is to heed well the words be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> what is being said to us here? Are we not to have full reliance upon the word of God and not to have reliance upon the word of man? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the, of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Are we being told here to set aside the law of Moses? Negative. Are we being told to set aside the covenant that God has offered through Moses? Negative. Okay. Then what are we to do? Well, we're supposed to study. We're supposed to study and understand. I mean, basically what we have been doing, um, which is a heart-searching study of God's word. The first word in what I just well, read. Well, remember. Right. So this is the past. Correct. <clears throat> Are we not to build up the waste places are we not to remember the old ways mm -hmm. ask for the old paths exactly now how can we ask for the old paths if we are not willing to understand or investigate what the old paths are well you know because I grew up in the United Church of Canada. In the, in the United Church of Canada, there was this movement away from uh, the past. The United Church of Canada is sort of like the Methodists. I mean, it, it's Methodist, Presbyterian, and Congregationalists that united. And um, there definitely was not any sort of historic look at the past. You, you never talked about any of the, the past history of the church. 
And it was always, of course, about love. So that any, any story that was ever taken from the Bible was some kind of illustration of, of some sort of love. I mean, it was made to make you fall asleep um, spiritually. And that's what, of course, what we see in Adventism today. We don't see many people interested in understanding Adventist history. Um, we have an exception in our church in Warburg, where we have uh, the children's stories every Sabbath are on Adventist history, and a lot of the sermons are. Um, but that's not very common in Adventism, because no, there's an, no. embar- an embarrassment, really, about the past. But, of course, if the past was understood, there would be no embarrassment. It's, it's a misrepresentation of the past. So. Taking what others have studied and put their spin on it. Mm-hmm. So when we compare this that Mrs. White had written here, with what she, what I read earlier from Southern Watchmen, what do we see? So if we are to remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him unto him in Horeb for all of Israel, yet we, we are also hearing that as the children of Israel, God's favored people persisted in rebellion, notwithstanding the warnings and reproofs he had sent them, they were challenged to prepare to meet their God. Are we to be so challenged today? Mm-hmm. Well, absolutely. I will answer one of your questions from back. Okay. Um, I see a parallel to what is going on in those statements right there uh, with the Adventist church. Okay, can you go? Can you explain a little bit more? Okay, well, as you read, um, as you read, and you see that there is a rebellion that is going on. Uh, at, when I have traveled throughout the United States and have gone to different uh, churches, I see the same rebellion, and I also see it on the internet as well. The more we've studied into this, the more I, I've been intrigued because when we start to look to understand the covenant that God had offered, and when we are looking at each of these points as we, as we addressed this last Sabbath, when we're looking at the different aspects whenever God was approaching the children of Israel with a warning using the symbol of a day for a year. Each time we would find that that day for a year symbol was a warning about rebellion. I have been, I, I've been unable to find anywhere where the day for a year was not tied to a direct rebellion by the children of Israel. Hmm. Jeff had a series on that. Talk some, a little bit about that. Quite a while ago. <clears throat> yeah. So the question that we have right now, whether we are looking at a day for a year in Eden, whether we are looking at a day for a year in the life of Jacob, whether we're looking at a day for a year with the spies when they went into Canaan, whether we are looking at a day for a year in Ezekiel, in Exodus or Leviticus, the children of Israel chose rebellion over submission. Mm. 
when God is giving us a covenant, he's reaching out to us. We're not, we're not reaching out to him. We're not seeking a covenant with him. He's seeking to provide a covenant with us. Yeah. Now, Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that you're mentioning there, so we know that in, this is our morning studies topic, reform lines. But right. When you have um, one of the great reformatory movements arise, it's at the end of a prophetic period. It's connected to a prophetic period. And so those time prophecies are going to be fulfilled in a period of darkness. Agreed. Yeah. So is that period of darkness part of the rebellion? Or is it the ending of the rebellion? Well, it's 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 supposed to bring about the end of a rebellion, but that rebellion still persists for a large class that doesn't receive the reform, that doesn't respond correctly to the reform movement. All right. Throughout, throughout the Adventist church, I find it very interesting that these charts are largely set aside. You bring out the charts and in almost any church, you're immediately held suspect as being someone that's divisive. Yes, I agree. Now, it's sad considering what Mrs. White has had offered about these, char these charts. <laughs> but they don't want to listen. They don't want to accept what is plainly presented upon the charts because it goes right to the core of the rebellion. I am instructed to urge upon our people most earnestly the necessity of religion in the home. Among the members of the household, there is ever to be a kind, thoughtful consideration. Morning and evening, let all hearts be united in reverent worship. At the season of evening worship, let every member of the family search well his own heart. Let every wrong that has been committed be made right. If during the day one has wronged another or spoken unkindly, let the transgressor seek pardon of the one he has injured. Often grievances are cherished in the mind and misunderstandings and heartaches are created that need not be. If the one who is suspected of wrong be given an opportunity, he might be able to make explanations that would bring relief to the other members of the family. Here's an admonition. Do not let the sun go down upon your anger. Of course, this, this applies to the family and, and is extremely important. That was uh, Toby's message. Uh, yes. And um, a couple of weeks ago. Now, we know that um, this also really applies within the church itself. Yes. This is just uh, the principle being applied within the family, which is where it must start. Um, if it doesn't start there, how will it ever grow within the church? Mm. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed of all spiritual infirmities, that sinful dispositions may be changed. Make diligent work for eternity. 
Pray most earnestly to the Lord and hold fast to the faith. Trust not in the arm of flesh, but trust implicitly in the Lord's guidance. Let each one now say, as for me, I will come out and be separate from the world. I will serve the Lord with full purpose of heart. For we are not come unto the mount that might be touched, that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice that they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceeding fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, <laughs> which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that sprinkle speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of these things that are shaken, and of the things that are made, and those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably and reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Shall we heed the warnings that God has given? The Lord will show his loving favor to those who keep his commandments. The word, the living word, received and obeyed, will be a savor of life unto life. The reception of the truth will regenerate and cleanse the sinful soul. Where does this begin? Well, the individual. Yes. I mean, that's one of the things that I always have a problem with is okay. we can look at the church and we can look at others quite easily. But really, the warning comes to us as individuals first. Yes, it does. And it is an individual work. Mm -hmm. One of the documents that, that was sent along last week was that this is very much an individual work. Mm -hmm. But in this situation, in the individual work, does it not mean that we need to be accepting of the covenant that God has offered first and foremost? Mm -hmm. Yes. If we don't accept his covenant, how can we then hold to his law? How can we accept his statutes? The church, as a collection of individuals, has not accepted the covenant that's been offered. Is this not our great failing? Uh -huh. <clears throat> does this not go right back to what she's written here 
shall we heed the warnings that God has given? What were the warnings? Leviticus 25 and 26. If we are unwilling to heed these warnings, and we can go even further back than that, but if we're unwilling to heed these, then we are no better than what we've seen from the children of Israel. This work of individual purification of character cannot be safely delayed. Let that sink in for a minute. Let our brethren and sisters take hold diligently of this work, cooperating with him who loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Again, this work of individual purification of character cannot be safely delayed. We are not in safety if we are choosing to walk in our own paths, or if we are choosing to kindle fire of our own kindling. Put away all deception. <clears throat> Let no one Idolize his own opinions. Take your position decidedly to be fully consecrated to truth and to righteousness. Christ is ready to receive all who will come to him. Exercise a firm faith in all the promises of God. With confession and prayer, take your stand to be holy, the Lord, henceforth and forever. Use the word idolize, idolize of our own opinions. <laughs> I've had a lot of emails back and forth with other friends. I've had some that are crowing about the wonderful messages that they're hearing from this pastor or from that pastor. Always with, you really need to be listening to what they're having to say, rather than you need to be searching the word to see what it has to say. Yeah, it doesn't take very much time on in a week to listen to a Sabbath sermon, right? Right. Sermon, sermonizing, not a sermonizing. But to study out a topic takes much more time. Very, very much. The other, the other thing I find that often, and, and I can't say this is all the time, but often, you know, people have directed me to messages they've heard. Um, that they particularly find impressive. And, <clears throat> and most of the time what you see is a message that is about other people. It's not a message that brings personal conviction. It's, it's usually something about some problem outside of us that we have no control over. And people find those types of messages uh, particularly attractive. Yeah, they're smoothing to the, what is it, they tickle, tickle the ears or something like that? What's the phrase? Yes. So we think it's a hard-hitting message because it's a message against the church or, or something. Something that, that we're, it's not a message against us. And, you know, we have to read the spirit of prophecy. We have to study God's word. Knowing that it's a message to us personally, that the rebuke and counsel will do us no good unless we ourselves follow that, that counsel. 
and that's why I always have had so much problem with people who focus upon the faults of the church. Um, because often that's just a way of avoiding their own faults. That's the way that we avoid dealing with our, our own faults is really a type of gossip. And, and it's hid under a cloak of, of care, concern, whatever. Uh, but it's really not taken to heart individually. Yeah, isn't it a diversion from applying it to self? Mm-hmm. Well, let's use a, a different form of an example. In many ways, these other messages that are, are given about things that are outside of the individual responsibility. It's very much like providing something to eat to others. Now, these messages, these very specific messages, these messages that go right to the core of our responsibility, they're not always the food that we want to eat. Mm -hmm. But we are to partake of this because if we will not, how will we ever come to the point that we will accept the message that is represented as the looking glass message. How can we ever come to the point that we're really willing to examine ourselves to see if we perfectly reflect the character of Christ? To my ministering brethren, I would say, unite in a work of humbling your souls before God. Some have lost their first love and need a new experience. Be determined that you will not yield to the enemy. Be patient toward all men, remembering that Christ has died for them. Improve every capacity for the Lord's work and labor faithfully, untiringly, to save souls. Seek to arouse the churches by your own zeal. <clears throat> Thus, you may be the Lord's helping hand laborers together with him. We all have a part to act in the Lord's great plan for his work in the earth. <clears throat> we shall all have something to do, though it may be in jots and tittles, as opportunities present themselves. Um, what this statement reminds me of a little bit is um, um, when I read Adventist Home when I was uh, a very young father. Um, and one of the things that I learned is that I could not correct my children if I myself was not correctable. And that if I did wrong, I needed to confess that wrong to whoever I harmed, whether it was my children. Many parents sort of think that we shouldn't, we shouldn't show our, make ourselves vulnerable to our children, that we shouldn't show our faults. We kind of hide. We try to show them that we're righteous as an example. But the example of humility, um, if that was exercised not just by our pastors, but by every person in the church, God would be able to do a work. And this part of just doing the little things, you know, what she talks about, the jots and tittles. Um, this, is, this is God's organization. This is how God does things. It's not some big work that we imagine that needs to be done. It's those little things. And those little things, um, I, I really think, are the biggest things. They're just not recognized as such by the world. Well, <clears throat> let's be honest. In our characters, we're willing to consider tackling the big things. Mm -hmm. But we're not always willing to look that we need first 
to handle the little things, the things that we see as unimportant, the issues within our own lives. Oh. <clears throat> so Mrs. White is being very blunt with us today. If these warnings are not heeded, if diligent work is not made to overcome and put away defects of character, God will soon have finished the work of judgment and many will be found wanting. Many, many tackle you farson. Shall we now at once cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God? We cannot afford to delay this work of confession and humbling of soul that our offerings may be acceptable unto God. Fullness of joy is to be found in an entire surrender to God. Now, I find interesting she wrote this September 5th of 1906, <clears throat> but it was published in November of 1906. Hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that last statement is one we really need to remember. Fullness of joy is to be found in an entire surrender to God. How else will we find joy? How else will we find true joy? No other way. But even in the church, that's not taught. Right. So this document, being very, very specific and very blunt, tied with this with Malachi, is giving us an admonition for today. <laughs> now, this next document I found very interesting. The manuscript itself kept in trial. Has some very interesting points for us to consider. I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more than they can do. The priests and the rulers did all that lay in their power against the only begotten Son of God and against all who acknowledged him, for they were imbued with the spirit of him who is a liar and a murderer. But though Satan vented his spite against the children of God and their great head, he could not control the conscience or tarnish the soul. He may cause all the suffering possible to the body, but he cannot change the character of the man who conscientiously serves God. <clears throat> we will undergo trials. <clears throat> Excuse me, we will undergo battles, but if our character is completely and totally reliant upon God, what they do to the body will be of no consequence. Today, men may persecute even unto death in an effort to make their fellow men worship an idle Sabbath, which has been brought into existence by the man of sin, who thinks to change times and laws. But to torture and put to death the body is all they can do. Satan makes a continual effort to ruin the souls God is seeking to save. By his masterly inventions and crooked deceptions, he seeks to confuse men's minds in regard to the way, the truth, and the life. A three-step process. 
a three-step testing process. Under his direction, men have inflicted untold pain and misery on their fellow men, but they have never been able to harm the soul. There is a power which can destroy both soul and body. I will forewarn ye whom ye shall fear. Fear him which, after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. The ruler of the universe bears long with the perversity of men, but he keeps a record of their works, and in proportion as they have caused pain to others, they will themselves be punished. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double, according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit as a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God that judges her. I find it interesting that Mrs. White is giving this comparison as a warning to the church. Yes? Yes. Mute it. Okay. I was just about to ask if you would translate that, Theodore. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> okay. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. No earthly ruler could show himself so jealous of his honor, so interested in his subjects so kind and tender to those who put their trust in him, as does the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the ruler high above all rule <clears throat> and all authority. He has strictly prohibited all the sin and has strictly enjoined practical obedience. It is Satan that fills the hearts, that fills man's hearts with a desire to do evil. Those who follow him the busy, incessant worker of evil, are not content with imperiling their own souls. They present every inducement which they think will lead others to imperil their souls. If these cannot rule, they seek to ruin. A spirit of exasperation, of revenge, of hatred works in the children of disobedience as it worked in the first great rebel. He imbues his followers with every species of malignity against those who cannot be induced to join his ranks. Gaping prisons are open before them. They are threatened with the chain gang and the stocks. Thus men treat those who worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. Have they forgotten that as they judge and punish, so they will be judged and punished?
Mrs. White continues. There's there's quite a bit within this the, within this one manuscript. Now, as we look here, she gives quotes from Revelation 19. Why would she be giving quotes from Revelation 19 in conjunction with Malachi 4? What exactly is is being quoted here that John has written? Well, that's the basically the destruction of the wicked at the end. Okay. Along with the governments of the earth, right? Yeah. yeah. Now here, Christ says, beware of false prophets, which come to you in, in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? If we are to know the false prophets by their fruits, if we are looking, if they are giving a peace and safety message, if they are saying that everything is all right, everything is good, you do not need to worry. When we need to be doing this work, this heart work of purification, then do we not see the fruits of their devising even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit wherefore by their fruits ye will know them not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doth the will of my Father which is in heaven. How are we to do the will of God? Are we not to take and accept this covenant that he has offered? And by accepting the covenant begin to understand his statutes and his laws in a way that we've never understood them before. Let the Lord Jesus testify in regard to the fruit he bears. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the poor. Isaiah 61. We know this quote well, do we not? Have we not addressed this in what, what Christ had, had given when he was handed the scroll in the temple? The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, not to sentence them to prison and in exile, to chain gangs and stocks. And the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that ye may be glorified. Isaiah 61, 1-3. 
This is the work of Christ. What a contrast it is to the work of Satan. Now, the question, the comment is raised, is this for those who will witness and experience Revelation 19? Everything that we're being offered is for our experience. It's for our, our admonition. If we are willing to listen, then we are willing to learn. The Lord has not forgotten his people who live in this age. Is that not a promise to us today? That's a marvelous promise. Is this not the pro a promise to those that would accept his covenant and agree to live according to his statutes that we would not be forgotten. But thou, Israel, art my servant, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my servant. Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant. I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. If this is the case, is there not great joy in being his servant, and in not being cast away? Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Strengthen, help, uphold. We are not to fear. Are we not shown here from Isaiah 41 that he will in three ways show us his glory and his strength for our benefit. Is there anything here that's being said by your power, by the strength of man, that this is going to occur? Um. Is this not totally and completely from God's power to us. <clears throat> Behold, all they that were incensed against thee <clears throat> shall be ashamed and confounded, for they shall be as nothing. <clears throat> and they that shall strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them and shall not find them, even them that contended with thee. They that were against thee shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not. I will help thee. Fear not, thou worm, Jacob, and ye men of Israel. 
I will help thee, saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is Holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Ye shall know them, know them by their fruits. Do those who accuse God's children come under the head of contrite ones? Do those that set aside the charts come under the head of contrite ones? Do those that are opposing the examples that have been being given of the 777 of July 18th of November 9, are they under the head of contrite ones? Instead, they show to the world, to angels and to men that they have chosen to stand under the banner of the Prince of Darkness to swell the numbers of those who love and make a lie. I realize what was just said may be difficult for some. We have to ask the question, whose banner are we standing under whose banner do we seek to stand? We are living in probationary time. Truer words have not been offered. There are only two sides, only two parties. I'm not seeking to speak of Democrat and Republican. I am not speaking to speak of conservative and liberal. There is Christ's banner and the black banner. Of those whom God seeks, of those whom God sees that he can trust because they are loyal and obedient, he said, they that, it looked like Samuel just joined up. Yeah, I'm just trying to mute them. But uh, for some reason, I can't. Uh, they're muted now. Okay. They that feared the Lord spake often to one another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Malachi 3, 16 to 18. This is giving us the example of the probationary time in which we live. Behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be as stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. And it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. The Lord makes a covenant with his people. For those of us that speak English, this is not 
a comment of the past. We can recognize that God has made a covenant with his people in the past. Yet how many times has that covenant been kept? It's always been kept by God, but has his people kept the covenant? No. Fourth generation strays away. Here is God makes a covenant active today. The Lord makes a covenant with his people today. Are we willing to accept it? After being tested and tried, those who are loyal to his commandments are pronounced trustworthy members of the royal family, children of the heavenly king. God declares, he that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. Revelation 21, 7, Revelation 3, verse 5, and verse 12. Here again, are we willing to accept his covenant? Or are we seeking to have a covenant of our own devising? These things saith he that is holy, he that is true. He that hath the key of David, he that openeth and that no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and has not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make of make them of the synagogue of Satan, which, excuse me. I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwelleth upon the earth. God's promise here is that he will keep thee from the hour of temptation. And he's telling us it's going to come upon everyone. Brothers and sisters, understanding <clears throat> and keeping the covenant that God offers is the work that is before us. I believe that this is no different than coming to the courtyard of the temple. I believe it is no different than understanding justification, sanctification, and judgment. We have a choice at this time. Whose banner under which we are choosing to stand? Christ has promised that he will come quickly. 
it is up to us to hold fast which we have, that no man will take your crown. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter into the gates, into the city. Compare these words with the warning. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they shall have no rest, nor night, day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that kept the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So again, we have present tense active. We are not dealing with the past. We are dealing with the here and now. For here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Is the faith of Jesus not complete abiding trust in his father and in the covenant that he has made? What are your thoughts? It's pretty clear, but will we receive it? Okay. With the title of this article, Kept in Trial, are we not seeing that God is able and is willing to hold on to those that will hold on to him? That the more we trust in his father, in our father, the more we may know that he will keep us so that as we trust him, we can trust that he will perform his word. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Revelation 12, 10 to 12. Malachi is written more for our time than the time in which it was written. The symbols of Malachi are symbols that we today are to understand. The symbols of Malachi are provided for us 
so that we may know that we of this time are not being forgotten. What else do you see? In the chat, it is said. As we hear these words with our heart and our mind, we will be strengthened for what is upon us. We are provided with the strength that comes from God. Amen. We cannot expect to rely upon the word of man, the strength of man for what is about to occur. We need to take joy in the fact that our Heavenly Father is not only willing, but is able to fulfill his word. Amen. Now, I'm going to shift back to the document that we were using two weeks ago. I've got a, a spot marked here where we left off. Do we regard the kingdom of Babylon as more important in the estimation of God than are the instrumentalities and responsibilities he has entrusted to his chosen people upon whom the ends of the world are come? We have here the workings of the great I am to change even the heart of a heathen king. There is a watcher just as really taking cognizance of all the works of the children of men but in a special sense of those who are to represent God by receiving his sacred truth into the heart and receiving it to the world. The workers in our institutions are far more accountable than was the king of Babylon, for his course of action is laid out before us, and we may learn, therefore, the lesson God desires to teach us. What does this say to you? What comment can you take from this for your own admonition and strength for today? Here's where we are. If the workers in our institutions are far more accountable than was Nebuchadnezzar, then we are to learn the lesson that God desires to teach us. A heathen king is less accountable than the workers in our institutions. <clears throat> we are to be accountable for ourselves first. There is so much more light that we have had throughout the history of the Seventh day Adventist Church. Yet the workers in our institutions are far more accountable than was Nebuchadnezzar.
There are those who need to learn that the heavenly universe is acquainted with all the works of the children of men. I read this, and that is very fearful. How many people want even their secret things known to their friends, let alone known to the heavenly universe? I pray that the Lord God of Israel may impress it upon our responsible men, that if they turn from his word to their human ideas and plans, they are without excuse. A spirit has been coming in that God abominates. A spirit of selfishness, self-exaltation, pomposity. It is time that there was a change in the program. He that sitteth in the heavens requires that a different spirit shall control the proceedings of councils and of committees. The principles practiced are not only detrimental to all within the sphere of their action, but they will lead to development of character so objectionable that its possessor cannot find a place among the redeemed. In all your assemblies, there is present a watcher who will not long bear with the perversity of men that have had so great light and so great opportunities. What was the sin of King Nebuchadnezzar? Pride. He placed himself where God should be. What was his retribution? Degradation. His reason was taken from him. The Lord will chastise his people. Those who are true at heart will see that his purpose is not merely to separate the sin from the sinner, but by his own light to reveal the sin which led the soul away from God and which would be its ruin unless corrected. Here we are today. We are observing and living Laodicea. The church has become prideful. We are all guilty of this. The Lord will chastise his people. <clears throat> Over this last year, we have been being chastised. There are many that once walked with us that no longer walk with us. We cannot afford pride. We cannot afford self-exaltation. Because the longer we hold on to this, the worse would we become degraded. From the history of characters described in the word of God, we learn that prosperity is dangerous to spiritual life. It is not those who have lost their property that are the most likely to forget God. It is those who have a measure of prosperity or who have been successful in their plans. The cup that is the most difficult to carry is not the one that is empty, but the one that is full to the brim. <clears throat> this must be balanced with nice precision. Mm -hmm. To be restricted for want of means is, as I can testify, a great inconvenience. 
but prosperity too often leads to self-exaltation. Men feel that they are masters and that others are dependent upon them. Here is deception, delusion, and presumption. Is this not, again, a three-step test? Deception, delusion, presumption. But is that not going in the wrong way? The putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity. These deceived ones turn away from their fellow men from their rights. Every man in a position of trust is to respect and treat kindly every other man. Let none feel that they are too great and too wise to follow the example of Christ. When a little power is placed in the hands, let them not do as did the king of Babylon in his self-approbation. Here again, Mrs. White returns again to Malachi 4. When in the synagogue at Nazareth, Christ read to the people from the role of the prophet Isaiah. He stood as the divine interpreter of the scripture, which he himself had inspired holy men to write. He read, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel unto the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Luke 4, 18 and 19. How terrible the blindness of the men of Nazareth that after their hearts had responded to the Holy Spirit's power, they became so enraged as to try to take the life of the Son of God. That history should be kept before you as an exhibition of the result of hardening the heart in unbelief and of pride. Help thou mine unbelief. Was a prayer offered before Christ. Are we any different today? Have we perfected our faith? Or do we find at times that our hearts have become hardened in unbelief and pride? I pray that this is not my situation. Yet, I fear that there are times that it is. How terrible the blindness of the men of the Seventh-day Adventist Church that after their hearts responded to the Holy Spirit's power from the examples of the 1843 and the 1850 chart that they became so enamored with the teaching of the world to ignore the warnings being given by the Son of God. Mrs. White was very clear that in 1888, had Christ himself appeared before this conference, 
that the men, the leadership of their time, would have just as assuredly put Christ to death again. We have to ask ourselves daily, are we any different from they? Review and Herald, March 19th, 1895. The Lord is soon to come. There must be a refining, a winnowing process in every church. For there are among us wicked men who do not love the truth. There is need of transformation of character. Will the church arise and put on her beautiful garments, the righteousness of Christ? It is soon to be seen who are vessels unto honor. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lighted with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Here we have Revelation 18. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all and him all that do wickedly, shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healings in his wings. We are given examples and we are given promises. Do we have the strength and the ability to accept these promises and to honor the covenant that God has made with us? What are your thoughts? Well, in order to honor this covenant, I mean, we need to know what it is. And I, and I think that's part of the problem. You know, one of the things that we see in, in you know, we can look at the church and the problems in the church, but we saw that the same sort of spirit existed in this movement and still does exist. Right. So, so, you know, the question is why? Because we're, we've been studying, you know, this message for a long time. We, we understand, at least in some ways, the return to the old paths. But the focus has always been um that somehow there people think that they're they're in control of what is truth and yet we don't fully understand the truth that that is we need to study individually but also study together and there's this reluctance to do so that when people differ with us in some way in our understanding, we're unwilling to study with them. And there, and, and, and then there are some people that are unwilling to, I mean, it, it's so easy to see the problem in other people. That's really what I'm trying to say. To see that, you know, somebody else is the problem when the only person that's the problem is me. 
because I'm the only one I have control over. And, and, and that's the thing I always worry about every time I see this type of counsel is that we're always going to be in our minds directing it at other people because that's the easy thing to do. Yet the vision of the looking glass, how many, how many people does that involve? Well, me and Christ. Right. So how do we come to understanding the third angel's message if we are not understanding the vision of the looking glass? Well, we have to experience it. And, and the thing is, we do at times, right? Because that's what James says. Okay. You know, we, we look into the law, but we walk away from, from it, not re remembering what manner of man we were. So how does he say it? Um, he says, um, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass or a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And, and of course, you know, we, we did looked at this in comparing it with uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, where it's talking about Moses and the glory uh, and so forth that, that was done away. And he says, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So it's the same illustration, but two different classes, right? There's a class that forgets what manner of man he was and just goes about living his life the same way he did before. And then there's, there are those who are changed into the same image from glory to glory. And so the question is, which kind are we going to be? Are we going to be a forgetful hearer or are we going to be a doer? And in order to become a doer, um, this means to continue, continually look at Christ in the way that God has given us to look at him, in the prophecies, in his word. And, you know, for me, I have to, I find that I need to ask him to reveal what's in my heart. Otherwise, I don't recognize it. Isn't that so true? And isn't that something we need to be doing day by day, sometimes even hour by hour and moment by moment? Mm -hmm. Uh, she did say that uh, every breath should be a prayer. Right. You know, I've experienced he will, he will reveal what's in our hearts if we truly ask him. Here are brought plainly to view those who will be vessels unto honor, for they will receive the latter rain. Every soul that continues in sin in the face of light, now shining upon our pathway, will be blinded and accept the delusions of Satan. We are now in, nearing the close of this earth's history. Where are the faithful watchmen on the walls of Zion who will not slumber, but faithfully declare the time of night? Christ is coming to be admired in all them that believe. How painful is it, it is to contemplate the fact that the Lord Jesus is being kept in the background. 
How few magnify his grace and exalt his infinite compassion and love. There will be no envy, no jealousy in the hearts of those who seek to be more like Jesus in character. The gospel is now resolutely opposed on every hand. Now, that's quite a strong statement. Because the world thinks <clears throat> the gospel is all about love. But as Revelation shows us, the gospel is the three-step prophetic testing message. Never was the confederacy of evil greater than at the present time. The spirits of darkness are combining with human agencies to set them firmly against the commandments of God. Traditions and falsehoods are exalted above the scriptures, reason and science above revelation, human talent above the teachings of the spirit, forms and ceremonies above the vital power of godliness. We need the divine touch. Is there more that needs to be said here? What God is saying Through his prophet, we today are to be taken to heart. It's our choice. We can recognize that the gospel is being opposed, that a false gospel has gone out. Are we willing to stand up? and be the ones that will truly proclaim the gospel in its purity? That's the question that we have before us today. Shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father, We thank you for these words of admonition. And though we do not like it, we ask for your strength so that we may more properly examine and look upon the characters that we have made. Father, these are not pretty. It is not like that of the character of your son. We ask, Father, for your blessing. But we also ask your forgiveness. And we ask for your guidance so that we may more properly represent Christ to all of those with whom we come in contact. Father, we need you. We can do nothing without you. We ask for your guidance now. Be with us in all that you would have us to do for this Sabbath and beyond. For this, Father, we thank you. And in this we praise you, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Record.